and I'm starting the recording and good morning, afternoon and evening everyone. My name is Mark Canavera. I'm the Associate Director of the Care and Protection of Children Learning Network, whose secretariat is housed at Columbia University. And today we are very excited to be um, presenting our second webinar in a two-part series on the initiative on child rights uh, in the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Those are two different compacts that the United Nations are developing and in March we heard from both um, but the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and the International Organization for Migration about the processes involved in developing these compacts. Um, this initiative is co-led by two people that we will hear from today. Daniela Reale, the Child Protection and Children on the Move lead at Save the Children, and Ignacio Packer, the Secretary General of the Terre des Hommes International Federation. Uh, these two individuals have been shepherding a process by which um, civil society and other actors are uh, helping the leaders of these compacts to think about how children and children on the move should be uh, considered within them. We will hear briefly about those the, the initiative from those individuals and then we will hear from the researchers and thinkers who are uh, doing the difficult work and the heavy lifting of actually digging into um, what these two global compacts should include. And those are Jacqueline Bamba, who is a professor at Harvard University and a global expert on children on the move, and Mike Dottridge, who is a consultant on human rights and children's issues, child protection. I'm sure those of you who have operated in this sphere uh, have heard their names for many years. To launch the webinar, I am going to start with a question, a poll that all of the attendees should be able to take. It is, what is your main interest in joining the webinar? There are five options there. Please take a few seconds. Is it that you follow the Global Compact on Refugees, that you follow the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, that you follow both Global Compacts, uh, or that you have a general interest in advocacy for migrant and refugee children? And I'm noting as we run this poll that uh, there is a tiny typo in the first two. It should be the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Uh, a large number of you have participated at this point, 72%. Uh, I'll leave it open for five, four, three, two, one more second. And with 83% of you voting, um, we see that 65% uh, or two-thirds of you have an interest in advocacy. Um, so that's very helpful for our speakers to know. Um, with that poll having happened, uh, I will now turn the microphone over to Daniela Reale, the Child Protection and Children on the Move lead at Save the Children, uh, to tell you about the initiative. Over to you, Daniela. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, um, and good evening, potentially, to all of you. Thanks very much for this introduction, Mark. Um, I'm really, it's a real pleasure to be here to introduce to you the, um, the initiative on child rights in the global compact. So as Mark was saying, this initiative was born very much at the end of uh, uh, last year. Um, as you, as most of you will know, in September, the United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, held a high-level summit on for refugees and migrants, um, during which the New York Declaration was uh, was adopted. Um, through this declaration, the international community expressed some. Uh, commitments to share responsibility in, um, in, in, with regard to refugees and migrants. And um, it contains some important commitments um, 
and uh, some of them are specifically targeting children. So at the end of last year, a number of us uh, decided to come together and um, and work um, um, in um, and create um, this initiative to um, ensure that children rights would be very central in the negotiations that um, uh, that followed uh, and that uh, are going to be um, um, conducted in the next few months. Um, so as Mark was mentioning before, the New York Declaration initiated a process of uh, negotiation, a process of uh, development uh, for adopting two uh, specific agreements, one on refugees, which is the group which will be the Global Compact on Refugees, and one on uh, um, migrants, so the Global Compact on uh, Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. So um, our initiative, which brings together over 20 agencies, um, including the UN agencies um, we were mentioning last, um, 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 our guests in last, um, um, in our last uh, webinar, UNHCR and IOM, and uh, being uh, part of that, um, uh, of this initiative, but also UNICEF and um, many civil society organizations and experts. Uh, so over 20 agencies focusing very much on ensuring that children are very central in these processes. Our initiative is focusing particularly on uh, on a number of principles stated in the um, in the New York Declaration. Um, which uh, we'll, we'll be discussing uh, a bit later um, as uh, part of the discussion of, on the report that um, Jacqueline and, and Mike will uh, talk uh, to us about. So focusing on uh, the principle of non-discrimination integration, ensuring the priority of best interests of the child, access to services, ending child migration detention, promoting solutions and um, on uh, child protection. There are three pillars of our initiative. One is um, the very report we are talking um, about today. Um, uh, the second is a global conference on uh, children on the move that we are um, organizing and will take place on the 12th and 13th of June. And the third uh, is our thinking around how to move forward um, after the conference and uh, all the way up to the um, to September 2018 when these processes will conclude and beyond. But let me just uh, very quickly mention about our global conference. Um, uh, it's uh, taking place, as I was saying, next month, and it will bring together um, a series of, uh, um, of stakeholders from um, UN agencies, civil society, um, practitioners, um, states, so government representatives, um, private sector, and um, experts, and importantly, uh, young people themselves, young migrants and refugees and displaced um, children that have that will bring the, uh, the the personal experience to um, to the conference. And um, um, and obviously, what is that? Uh, what we want to get out of this moment um, where this constituency will be together is to uh, think about how we can take action going forward um, around the a number of these com common um, or common objectives and priorities but also discuss what um, what are the steps to take what are the, the gaps that at the moment we are um, um, we are witnessing both in our programmatic work and in our policy work and what recommendations we want to take forward um, during the negotiations and uh, this uh, development of this um, agreements. Um, we will also in explore solutions and innovative examples um, uh, and practices. So um, we'll, uh, we'll bring um, out what is out there that is uh, new, innovative, but what is actually working. And also explore um, concrete opportunities uh, for action at various levels, not just at a global, but importantly, at the region and national level. So um, 
I think I will conclude here because uh, today is about um, listening to uh, Mike and Jacqueline and um, and thank you very much. I hope to see some of you or many of you um, that can make it um, at the conference and continue our conversation going forward. Thank you, Daniela. And um, before we turn to Ignacia, we have another uh, poll question for you. Daniela had mentioned a conference in June, June 12th and 13th. Um, and so we are wondering how you, the participants in this webinar, think the Children on the Move conference can best contribute to child rights, um, including key issues to include, identifying key issues to include in the global compacts, creating a constituency to advocate for child rights, uh, exchanging good practice um, or other. Obviously, we hope that the conference will be able to do multiple things, but if you were to prioritize one, we're wondering what that would be. So just take a few seconds to vote on this poll. We're nearing the halfway mark for voting. Um, 52%, 55, 56, 59, 60. Uh, once we get near 70, we will start a countdown. All right, five, four, three, two, one more second. We'll close the poll now. And with 77% uh, of you voting, so three fourths, um, you know, there's a pretty even split. Nearly half of you think that identifying key issues to include in the Global Compact should be part of the conference, uh, and an equal number thinking that creating the constituency to advocate for child rights will be important, and a good 20% still highlighting the need to exchange good practice. So thank you for that. Um, I will now hand the microphone to Ignacio Packer, the Secretary General of the Terre des Hommes International Federation. Over to you, Ignacio. Thank you, Mark, and uh, hello to uh, to all. And it's a pleasure to be on the on this call. My key words for the few minutes that uh, input uh, I'm going to give is dialogue, accountability, and beyond the global campaigns. Now, um, why do I talk about uh, dialogue? Because we, do, we are engaged with the Global Compact on Refugees and with the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration on a series of informal thematic discussions or uh, um, uh, called uh, thematic consultations for the uh, Migration Global uh, Compact uh, leading until uh, November, we would enter into another phase of stock uh, uh, keeping. This week in Geneva, there was the Human Rights of All Migrants, Social Inclusion, Cohesion and All Forms of Discrimination uh, thematic consultation, and this is for the Global Compact on Migration. Perhaps some of you on the call were there, and we heard quite some substantive uh, debates and difference of perception of migration and different examples that were coming up from different contributions from, uh, uh, from member states. And it's so important uh, to build on the many positive efforts and realizations of member states. But, but when we hear some of the things, we, it's quite clear that we are not managing to walk the talk. And uh, many of these are, are statements uh, that are extremely positive. And for organizations that are confronted to the situations in the ground and for the situation of migrants and refugees them, themselves, uh, we do hear some very surprising things um, or um, incoherent between what is said and what is uh, lived. Now, it's all around finally the issue of accountability, of monitoring, oversight and the human rights. These are key elements that seem to perpetually plague many member states. Um, sometimes I feel that accountability is a, a topic that is uh, followed around like a, like a bad smell. So what could we do as um, mainly a child rights um, uh, organizations, community, UN, private sector, trade unions, um, civil society, uh, migrant and diaspora organizations? 
Well, one of the tools that we're coming up with for dialogue with the, the member states is this working document of what we want in the global compacts uh, and that uh, uh, we're going to be talking about with uh, Mike and, uh, uh, and, and Jackie. They, of course, linked link to the, um, the goals and targets of the um, uh, Agenda 2030 because we believe that the global compacts must have an accountability mechanism and built on targets, um, goals, targets, indicators, a timeline. So member states are compelled to meet them by and, and by a certain timeline. Um, the Paris Agreement, for instance, of, on climate change um, seems to be a fairly appropriate model where certain provisions um, are, are binding and goals are set for nations to meet. And then there's an accountability uh, mechanism uh, and here for uh, migration and refugees could take different uh, forms, um, including using existing uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, so th the part of the initiative and as Daniela introduced it is um, really working with the expertise from UN agencies and civil society to work on this this document, a document which is for dialogue on what we want for children in the global compacts and on both compacts as a child is a child uh, no matter its residential law or migration status. So what we're aiming is a set of goals, targets and indicators with a timeline which is framed by this working document. And we believe this is a key contribution to the issue around accountability that goes beyond the specific issues of children. And I'm more and more convinced of this as we make progress in the different discussions with uh, member states, but also within civil society, and also with the, uh, the private sector, for instance, with the, the GFMD business mechanisms. Now, in terms of process, the working document for the moment is in a draft version, and there are some uh, 20 experts from different organizations that are um, uh, 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 giving support to Mike and Jackie, who are the pen holders and, and the brains uh, the main brains behind the, this work and they're supported also by uh, Amy uh, Hong uh, from um, uh, Terrorism but it's a large constituency of uh, experts working on this. Now this document will be available end of May and would be a support document for discussions at the Global Conference on Children on the Move which Daniela mentioned uh, or talked about on the 12th and 13th of June in Berlin. And shortly after that, the uh, final working document would be available. And this working document would already be presented at the um, XCOM UNHCR uh, um, side event, uh, still to be confirmed on the 29th of June but uh, in Geneva, but also at the same time at a side event at the Civil Society Days of the Global Farm on Migration and Development in Berlin also on the 29th of June. From then, the, the document is intended to be a support not only for dialogue with uh, member states and other stakeholders at global level, but also, and very importantly, to be brought down at national level for dialogue with uh, member states. This document also is um, focused initially on the global compacts, but I believe, believe if we do our work well, has a shelf life that goes beyond fall 2018 and can be used also for the advocacy work in, on uh, migration policies in almost all the, uh, the countries with perhaps some adaptation of the, 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 the priorities set uh, um, uh, and, and also uh, reviewing perhaps some of the, the timelines. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd have um, different questions, but I think, many questions, uh, but I think really it's the moment now for Jackie and Mike to go a bit more in the, the substantive uh, um, content of this uh, working document. So, over to you, Mark. 
Thank you, Ignacio. And yes, we will jump into the content now. Before we do that, uh, a third poll for you. How do you think the Global Compacts can best support to enhancing the protection and support of children on the move? There are five options here, um, including SDG or Sustainable Development Goal-like targets and indicators on child rights, including a system of coordination at various levels, reiterating general child rights principles, um, or providing operational guidance for responding to vast movement or vast migrations of people, or you just don't know. Um, please do take a few seconds. Um, while you do that poll, we've had somebody specifically request the names and the speakers, the names of the speakers and their organizations, so I will just repeat those. Uh, Daniela Reale was the first to speak, the Child Protection and Children on the Move lead at Save the Children, Ignacio Packer, Secretary General at Terra Deism International Federation, Jacqueline Baba the, is a professor at Harvard University, and Mike Dottridge, uh, ja Jacqueline and Mike will be speaking momentarily, presenting the work that they have begun to prepare, um, and Mike is a consultant on human rights and children's issues. Um, a few uh, last housekeeping comments as we head into the main part of the presentation here. Don't forget that you can use the question box or the chat box to communicate with us throughout the webinar. We have people monitoring those, and they will collate and bring all of the questions and comments from those to the presenters in a Q&A and discussion period towards the end. If you click on the tab that says um, handouts, you'll see five handouts there, which you will also receive after the webinar, uh, but you can look at them now as we're going through things. And um, finally, um, we will close this poll and head into the meat of the webinar with 81% of you voting. Uh, uh, plurality, 42% uh, indicating that a system of coordination at various levels would be the most important contribution that the Global Compacts can make. 29% or nearly a third focusing on operational guidance, and 26% or one-fourth uh, focusing on SDG-like targets and indicators. So I think it, we see a clear picture that reiterating general child rights principles doesn't seem to be a priority for you, but that the other items all have varying degrees of importance. Uh, with no further ado, um, I will hand the microphone and the screen to uh, Jacqueline Baba and Mike Dottridge. Over to you. And Mike, you should have the screen now and should be able to share your PowerPoint. Thank you very much. And I, I'm going to operate the PowerPoint and ask uh, Jacqueline to make some introductory remarks to explain what we've been doing so far. And then we'll talk you through on, on six different issues that at the moment are the focus of our paper. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Mike, uh, and thank you, Mark, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, I just want to take one moment before I go into the substance of the work that Mike and I have been doing um, to say how important this moment is. Um, veterans like Mike and myself have been working in this field for over two decades. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that this really is our golden moment. When we started working on issues related to child migration, this was a non-topic. And I imagine that many of you joining are too young to remember a, a time when issues of child migration were not um, the focus of advocacy, were not related to paid jobs, were not related to high-level meetings, but I can assure you that time was not very long ago. And I say this just to stress what a valuable political opportunity we have. This is a window of opportunity caused by a, a series of pretty tragic events, which we have a responsibility to exploit to the full. I have no illusions that we are going to be completely successful. I don't think that after our June meeting or after the September 2018 uh, UN meeting 
uh, everything will be perfect for children on the move or migrant children, refugee children, undocumented children, internally displaced children. But I think we have a real chance to make a difference. Um, that's my first general comment. So I do feel a real burden of responsibility at this point to do my best work and to encourage all of you not to take for granted the fact that we do actually have the ears of very senior policy makers at the moment. Um, and this is not something that is always the case, far from it. My second point is I think it's very interesting that only 2% of you in the last poll that Mark asked you to do said you thought reiterating general child principles was, was um, not the primary goal. Because actually, for all the, um, I hope, uh, sophistication and comprehensiveness of our work, I actually think that possibly might be the most important thing. Most people who are poli senior policy makers um, sitting in ministries as well as frontline workers at the borders or at uh, in immigration courts or in let alone in the detention facilities have no idea of child rights principles. They are enforcement people, they are immigration control people, they are political representatives looking anxiously over their shoulders. And I think the notion that all children have rights, things that we take as, as so self-evident that they don't really bear repetition, I think that sort of notion is really the exception. And just to give you a quick example, um, about three days ago, I had the opportunity of speaking with a senior Greek politician um, in connection with a, a, a piece of what we've just done, which you might have looked at on um, <coughs> excuse me, sexual exploitation of refugee and migrant children in the camps in Greece. And uh, we were discussing how the Greek government might respond better to the really large challenge they're facing. And um, this colleague, this, this politician, this, this um, political appointee was talking about the uh, competences of the migration department and the migration ministry. And I said, well, actually, I think we also need to involve in our discussions the child welfare department and the social ministries. And she said, oh, they don't have any competence on migration issues. And she was right. They don't have a competence. But that's the problem that the work we all do is thought of as really just the province of migration, border control, and security and law enforcement people. And the competence on children's rights and on child protection, child agency, all the rights that flow from the CRC, that is quite separate and hived off. And I think I'm probably preaching to the converted. I think all of you on this uh, webinar are familiar with that. But for me, this is still very much unfinished business. And so with those two prefatory comments, let me just um, take a few moments to just tell you a bit about the work that we've been doing. So Mike Dottridge and I were um, invited by the colleagues who've just spoken on, on behalf of their organization to prepare um, a, a document um, as a basis for developing a set of consensus goals from the child migrant, if you like, and child refugee advocacy community, a set of consensus goals to inform and influence the global compact process. And so we came to this work not only with the experience that we've had over the previous years, but also with the experience we had about a year ago crafting a very short document of principles to govern what we call children on the move and other migration related children. That document was intended as a brief, concise restatement of key principles. And so we just identified a two pages worth, I think of nine or 10 principles, which we thought would be useful as, a, as like a tool, really a, a, a sheet of paper for trainings, a sheet of paper for people to have on their desk as they made policy, to refresh themselves with as they made decisions. And what our principles did was gather together applicable international law um, and refer to it so that we had the authority and then explain 
um, in plain English what the problems that actually this constituency face are. So I think many people, for example, have heard of the notion of the best interest of the child from Article 3 of the CRC. But when you actually explain what best interest means in a situation where a child arrives um, without documents and without a legal status and is perhaps facing being sent back or being detained or being subjected to age determination, that focuses the mind. Then you think, ah, best interests. How does that change the way I would do business otherwise? That was our goal. So our principles, um, which have been quite widely circulated and I think um, not formally adopted but used, really form the basis for this work. So for this work, what we decided to do was, again, to strike a, the balance, the, the right balance, we hope, between simplicity on the one hand and accuracy and originality and depth on the other. And, you know, it's for you to judge how, how well we've done. And as both Daniela and um, Ignacio said, this is a work in progress. It's going to be very much a collaborative effort with our expert colleagues chipping in and chiseling away and correcting us and adding to what we've done. And also we hope very much with all of you. So we decided, and this is perhaps where we could move to the next screen, Mike. Um, we, we decided to um, have, uh, to, to, to develop something which as we say here, uh, summarizes the previous commitments made supplements is, is supplemented those those, those that, that summary is supplemented by existing principles and then the two last bullets perhaps the most important bring actual good practice examples to the fore to help policymakers um, improve on their practice to give people ideas to illustrate what an creative set of solutions might look like. And finally, to try to distill our thinking uh, in the way that the SDGs do into these three tiers of goals, targets, and indicators. So just to back up for one minute, um, our paper summarizes previous commitments, uh, and both it, it refers, therefore, to the New York Declaration, which, as you know, was the outcome document from the first ever UN General Assembly meeting on large-scale migration, a very momentous event. And this New York Declaration um, contains uh, a very comprehensive, I think, set of commitments. And for those of you who have not read it, I would really suggest you read it. It's a good document. It's a thoughtful document. And it does provide a very useful roadmap, I think, for all of us. And as has already been said, um, the decision was to go uh, as an outcome of this whole process of UN deliberation to go for two compacts. That was not obvious. It was not obvious that we would end up with two compacts. And some people, I think, were actually um, hoping that we wouldn't end up with replicating the dichotomy that we currently have in uh, migration law, if you like. But um, we did for a, 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 probably a, a range of, of political and institutional reasons. So that's the, those are the cards we've been dealt with, and that's the game that we have to play. So we are looking both at the, a refugee compact, which deals with the refugee framework, the protection framework already evolved. And on the other hand, for the first time, we're looking at um, a global system for managing migration, again, a, a new initiative. And then, again, as we've already said, we include within our document uh, reference to uh, both hard law, if you like, so UN conventions widely ratified, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We include reference to our principles, and we include reference to um, other materials as, uh, as they're relevant. Um, just a word about the goals, targets, and indicators. Um, this is a tiered approach, so the idea is to set out broad uh, goals first, possibly the most important in a way, to make sure that we're identifying the key deliverable that we want, and then to qualify them and itemize them more carefully as we go forward. This is the hardest part of our job, 
and it's the hardest part of all of our jobs. Partly it's unknown territory, so we're inventing as we go along. And partly I think at the end of the day, this is what's going to really help move things forward. So getting the right goals, targets, and indicators is very important. And this is where we really would welcome um, you know, ideas and inputs. So maybe I could just move on briefly to the next slide. So as I said, we decided to try to combine concision with uh, depth. And we have chosen these six topics or these six issues. Um, and as you'll see, they're wide-ranging issues, they're central issues. Um, and uh, within each of these, we've both included um, existing law and practice and some of our own ideas and our thinking as a prelude to, to the, the, the goals, targets, and indicators. So the reason we chose these topics is because we wanted to think about what in the current architecture is most in need of attention. Now, clearly, you could say everything is. You know, we need to look at, you know, justice systems. We need to look at due process. We need to look at torture. We need to look at a whole series of things. But we decided, rightly or wrongly, that these were the key points that would lend themselves to, to work. And so what we've done is, under these headings, set out both the general principles and then what we think our goals are. Maybe I'll just make two other general comments. One is, in any um, enterprise like this, you're always balancing yourself between a desire for an optimal, perfect outcome. And uh, as, as Mike has said many times, we're all very used to the normative framework. We're used to rattling off the legal entitlements that people have. We're used to citing human rights norms and so on. Um, but on the so that's certainly one domain looking at you know what would be a perfect outcome on the other hand of course we need to function in the real world we want to actually make a difference and we have to take stock of the very um, complicated changing and worrying political context that we are working in so the balance between idealism and pragmatism is one we are all wrestling with and you'll see uh, the, the um, compromises we've made and decide whether you think we've, we've uh, ended in the right spot or not. Um, just a, maybe one other point here, which is that some of these terms will be very familiar to you. Um, uh, terms like best interest of the child, everybody working in the child rights field is familiar with that terminology. Some of you will be very familiar with the fact that child immigration detention is one of, is kind of the top of the list of our of our the rights violations that we are both concerned about and maybe have some glimmer of hope of actually being able to, to, to really uh, change. Um, some of you may be less familiar with terms like child protection, which are terms of art, and both include a general notion that children are children first and second, but more specific engagement with questions just of abuse, exploitation, and neglect. So, we try to address all of these and 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 um, you know and and balance. And the last thing I'll say is you'll notice item six uh, says access to services for child refugees and migrants, and we've just picked three key ones: shelter, education, and health. Again, this is an arbitrary choice, but we went with the what we thought were the most critical aspects. And of course, shelter includes other issues like sanitation and housing and so on. Health includes both physical and mental and psychosocial. And education includes both pre-K and primary right through to, um, to, to tertiary. So, um, you know, these are capacious categories. Okay, let's move on. So, um, I'm um, Mike and I, actually, Mike, do you want to say a few words now about the actual six issues, or do you want me to go ahead and, and just talk about the three that that um, that I drafted? Well, why don't we, we start with non-discrimination, uh, which you've drafted, and then I'll take over when we get to durable solutions, okay? Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so the first issue we looked at is non-discrimination, and in a way, um, this is 
one of the overarching issues. Um, <coughs> this first bullet really addresses non-discrimination uh, in terms of uh, of race, ethnicity, uh, nationality. But we also, of course, are concerned with non-discrimination in terms of age. But this, uh, this uh, bullet uh, reiterates what the New York Declaration said, which is we commit to combating xenophobia, racism, and discrimination in our societies against refugees and migrants. So this is just an overarching commitment. And obviously, to make any difference, this is going to have to be carefully itemized, and this is a, a, a hornet's nest of, 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 of issues around how you combat xenophobia and racism and the extent to which you uh, use um, positive discrimination or other strategies. I mean, these are, are, are questions which each of us will confront in our own environments, but it seemed appropriate to start with this general commitment. So we're talking both about an overall commitment uh, in terms of media and political statements and, and the public sphere and then we're also talking about the delivery of services and access to services and you see here uh, uh, the reference to education healthcare justice and language training again we've just picked out these um, but there of course could be many other issues um, that 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 uh, where non-discrimination is critical so um, as, as has already been said, if you have examples of really good practice here, for example, of the use of firewalls to protect the transmission of information from one agency to another, um, that would be very helpful. Those seem to be some of the most effective ways of uh, ensuring um, inclusion and non-discrimination. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide, please. So here are two of our uh, the two goals, and you can just read them. <coughs> so they just pick out what you saw in the previous slide. So the one is at the general level, um, very um, broad set of uh, commitments, and the second is more specifically geared to thinking through constructively and positively access to services. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the second bullet, um, this is not just non-discrimination, but it's actually positively improving access. So if that's, it's interesting to think, and many of you will have been involved in this, how different destination states have dealt with the challenge of incorporating um, children who've been arriving in the last two and a half years. Some have made special classrooms, some have integrated kids right from uh, pre-K, pre-kindergarten. Um, <coughs> others have just had language training or separate separation within the school. There are a whole range of different approaches. <coughs> Excuse me, there's, um, <coughs> there's some very good research uh, showing how the earlier you integrate children, of course, the better. But there are many different modalities here. Next slide. <coughs> okay, Jackie, so why did, why, what, Jackie, why don't I comment on this one and give you a chance to, to recover your voice? This is really just to show you that we're looking as well at goals at the sort of sub goals, the targets that should be set, particularly for states to reach. Uh, and when we talk about goals, we're trying to work within the framework of the Agenda 230, goals to be achieved. Uh, by 2.30. Uh, but targets, of course, we can set much more uh, specific um, dates by which certain things should be done. Uh, we're not going to show you the targets on all the issues, but this is just to give an example that we might be setting a date by which something should be done. We might be saying uh, that a certain proportion of states should have achieved it. There are various ways in which we can uh, itemize it. Otherwise, what we're trying to do is take those two goals and then see, well, what is it within it, within the goal that really requires specific action? And then uh, for each of these targets, we'll try and come up with indicators, which would be measurements of, of progress. Uh, okay, back, Jackie, do you want to say anything more on the 
on the targets or should we go on to the next issue? Thank you, Mike. Um, I think I just want to say um, two more quick things on the targets. One is you'll notice in the first one that we include a range of different issues here. So provisions which discriminate against or between categories, including 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 in access, including in access to and political inclusion, birth registration, other tools for securing or improving legal identity, that all these measures of discrimination should be eliminated. So we're trying to create a really broad scope here. So again, if there are examples of how, you know, local administrations, cities, cities, municipalities, um, regions, states have done this by helping uh, different uh, non-citizen populations to uh, eliminate discrimination, that's exactly what we're trying to get at. Um, so um, that's one thing. And the other point is just to say that, um, as Mike noticed, no, noted, these are you know more specific than the goals, but they're still quite general. So we just have here a 50% increase at number three in access to legal identity by 2020. Of course, that's an arbitrary figure, but it's a way of trying to really create benchmarks to see how we're doing terms of inclusion. So um, we, we consider this question of legal identity, of having a status, being able to prove your status as a person entitled to law uh, as being a very fundamental right. Okay, that's it for that slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is another very general um, issue, best interest of the child. Um, and of course, this is um, a notion that's developed in, in Article 3 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I think it's important that we stress that again and again. The New York Declaration says, uh, reiterates this point, as you see in the first uh, bullet. Um, and what we are proposing is simply a simple goal here, which is to ensure that that understanding of best interest can, uh, applies to all children on the move, and this goes back to the point I mentioned earlier. So the idea of trying to bring together the migration and the child protection or child rights domains uh, more than has happened so far. Um, the last sentence, of course, is critical. Um, we've been saying for many years that we don't have as the quality of data that we need to monitor um, progress. And I think one of the things that we're hoping for from this venture is that more funding, more competence, and more attention are going to be paid to generating quality data that's disaggregated across age groups and, and regions and states and migration categories. So this will involve both, both general data collection, as in the census, but then also more specific uh, data collection, for example, uh, in, in situations of service delivery and so on. Of course, there's always a delicate balance here between comprehensively uh, collecting information about people on the one hand and on the other, surveilling them and exposing them to intrusive uh, questioning and investigation. So that's something uh, we have to, of course, attend to, the balance between information collection and privacy. Um, so, but just to say, this is a, a, a big challenge, but something that's critical. Jacqueline, this is Mark. Jacqueline, I just want to Mark, I just want to say that, say that we have about ten minutes left for you and I to finish your presentation of the work so far. Thank you, thank you very much, Mark. Okay, I'll just uh, quickly go through child protection. As I said, this is perhaps less familiar to, to some of you because this is. Uh, um, it's, it's not uh, an issue which is immediately highlighted in, for example, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but a critical issue. And so you'll see here what our, our, um, our general over, overall approach is. Uh, we're very particularly concerned, and this is what several of you picked out, maybe the majority of you picked out, the importance of having an arc of protection linking um, local, regional, uh, and um, and, and national um, authorities in their care of children, something that we've seen as being completely deficient in the current um, migration situation. So here we refer to that, and we talk about the importance of um, really relating to child protection authorities. And then we make reference to the refugee, uh, the comprehensive refugee response framework, which is uh, 
the refugee compact uh, framework. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so here we again have one goal, which you can just read. And what we're trying to do is cover both general questions of identification, but also then highlight um, the need for protection from violence, abuse, and exploitation. Um, the idea here is, of course, to anticipate intervention so you protect from harm, but also that you address it after it's occurred, if it has occurred, through appropriate um, services, including education, healthcare, and psychosocial care. And, of course, this is an area which is grossly deficient at the moment. Next slide. Okay, Mike, over to you. So I'm going to talk going to you a little talk. bit about solutions. Um, we may call them durable solutions, certainly with respect to refugee children. Uh, they're usually called durable solutions. Uh, but uh, the reference in the New York Declaration is only uh, committing governments to durable solutions for refugees. Uh, but what we're interested in is solutions in its widest sense uh, that will provide stability to either a child migrant or child uh, refugee. And for that reason, when we go beyond these fairly vague uh, commitments that have been made in the New York Declaration, uh, as far as solutions are concerned, when we go beyond them and look at uh, what goals to set, uh, well, there's four, whereas previously uh, it's been easier, there's only been one or two. And I put all four here so you can see in a way that we have options between being very general and quite specific. Uh, the first uh, two of these uh, goals uh, are very general. The last one, uh, uh, or indeed the last two, uh, which is uh, very specifically asking those governments that give asylum to asylum-seeking children only until they reach the age of 18, we're asking them very specifically to commit to giving uh, a genuine, durable, and sustainable solution that gives a child stability. Uh, and the last one, we're looking very specifically uh, at the uh, return of children from a country that they've maybe sought asylum in or else have, have gone to, hoping for um, a better livelihood. If they're being returned, uh, what's the process? At the moment, we know there is no uh, properly monitored process to ensure that abuse doesn't occur. We hear a lot of a lot of uh, horrific stories, but some disinformation. So uh, this is in a way to indicate that there are uh, some options, and we're still trying to choose between the very general uh, and the specific. And, and one option, of course, is to put the specific as targets rather than as goals. Uh, after solutions, we're discussing the very specific issue of children who are detained either by themselves or with other family members because of their immigration status. Uh, the New York Declaration is quite optimistic on this, optimistic enough for us to think, oh, this is an open door that we really need to push through and get commitments, and not just commitments from states which have given us a little so far, but from right around the, the globe, from places where at the moment uh, border authorities think it's entirely acceptable and normal to detain uh, child migrants. Uh, so there's a, a, a commitment there to uh, uh, um, only use detention as a last measure, as a measure of last resort. And the goal that we're uh, suggesting is progressively end the immigration detention of the of the children. Uh, and of course, linked to that in the targets will be a suggestion that alternatives in immigration detention uh, need developing, both as far as children and children and families are concerned. Um, I'll lead off on this last point, uh, but um, sorry, I'm not going to go into the detail on these targets. 
Uh, I'll lead up, off on the last point about services, uh, but then I'm going to ask uh, 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 Jackie to talk specifically about shelter and education. Um, the New York Declaration talks quite generally about uh, working to provide for basic health, education, psychosocial development, and, and so on. So it's implying that quite a wide range of services will be available for all children. And it, thank goodness it's talking about prioritizing budgetary to facilitate this. Um, at the same time, the, the, the reality is very, very different. Um, Jackie, would you like to take over now that I'm going to go on to the next slide and talk about uh, the six goals that we've got in relation to services? That's almost certainly too many uh, goals, but at the moment we've got six goals. Yes, thank you, Mike. So um, as I already said a few minutes ago, we know um, from both from our experience and from the research that's been done that incorporating um, refugee and migrant communities into domestic services as soon as possible is imperative, both to minimize um, trauma and uh, distress and also to minimize the risk of adverse reaction from the local communities. So for both uh, those reasons, this question of access to adequate shelter, education and healthcare on a par with citizens is critical. And of course, this is a very long way away. This is quite a, a large ask in many, in many situations. Um, our second uh, goal here refers to particularly vulnerable uh, communities, and often these vulnerabilities intersect, so you have uh, 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 multiple vulnerabilities. We mentioned unaccompanied children in particular, even though we are aware that there's also increasing concern about children who are accompanied, both by um, parents who may be depressed or otherwise unable to care for them, or by parents who are undocumented or otherwise fearful of being in touch with the authorities. So the fact that we, we highlight the vulnerability of unaccompanied children does not mean that we, we are not aware of, of the, the vulnerability of, of accompanied children too. And then there's the data point which I've already mentioned and uh, which is clearly going to need a lot of, a lot of work and attention. Um, next slide please, Mike. So thank you. So here we have um, um, reference to, to health um, and uh, to health systems more generally and uh, to basic health provisions. So I think these are, these are all um, really important questions. Um, and this, I think, entails both um, inclusion in what's already available, but also outreach to create and generate um, access to provision where, where none exists so far. And of course the point about legal status uh, is critical, refers back to the earlier point I made about firewalls, the imp importance of ensuring and making it clear to migrant communities that access to healthcare is not going to jeopardize their, their position in a, in a country because at the moment the evidence in many places is the opposite, that communities are are actually refraining from using health services because they're frightened of the consequences. Um, yes, next slide, please. Uh, we're almost at the end, Jackie. D let me just apologize for not having explained the acronym MHPSS, that's mental health and psychosocial support. So again, these th this is three <laughs> goals. I think that's far more than we can state all about health and with one of them focusing specifically on, on mental health with stress uh, being a, a major problem as well as uh, various forms of depression. So um, uh, we're still at the stage of uh, thinking through how much we want to uh, focus on goals that are even more general than ones that affect children. So linking it 
directly to sustainable development target 3.8 and to what extent we really want to focus down on something specific uh, for migrant children and although we're not going to go into the details now what we're looking for is not just good goals and targets but uh, really operational examples of where um, these targets have already been met something that shows to uh, disbelieving governments, particularly those in richer countries, that it really is possible to um, respect and promote uh, the, the rights of children who are refugees or migrants. Uh, and I think that's where we particularly want your um, assistance. So if uh, you want to contribute any specific information uh, about good practice or comment in other ways. Um, we've given you here on the, this slide the email address of our colleague Amy at Terre des Hommes. Uh, if you'd like to, to send any suggestions to her, we'd be very grateful. There is, of course, a huge literature, a huge amount that's published that we can refer to. Uh, it's extraordinary how much of that uh, is written up in situations um, involving developed countries. So a lot about North America, uh, a lot about uh, Europe, and of course, when it comes to immigration detention, quite a lot about Australia. Uh, so we are wanting to get geopolitical balance, if you like, the examples that we cite. Um, and that means I think we're looking for further evidence uh, from uh, Latin America, from Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, different parts of Asia. Um, I won't say that we can read all languages, but it doesn't need to be in English when you send it, so uh, anything here would be uh, very, very welcome. Uh, Jackie, back to you to say anything uh, uh, as we wrap up but before we hand back to Mark. Um, I think no, I think you've, you've covered everything. I think I just reiterate what you said, that we really would, I think our document is going to be um, uh, as good as the input we get. And, um, you know, everybody benefits from, from creative, everybody else's creative thinking. So if people have examples of situations where, for example, with adolescent, um, you know, children on the move, there's been really good outreach to make it possible to access health care or reproductive health, um, you know, or any other such uh, services, it would be wonderful to have that. Uh, I think there has been some very creative work done, uh, but it hasn't always, you know, risen to the fore, and a lot of the people who are doing the good work don't have time to write it up. So we would very much appreciate um, anything, however small the example. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I will... As we head into the question and answer period, thank you for that very um, rich presentation. It's obvious that a lot of work and thinking and reflection has already gone into this, uh, and it's going to be exciting to see the final uh, version. Uh, a poll for our audience members to get us uh, re-engaged and, and active participants again. Uh, Having heard this outline and the, th the thinking that has gone into it so far, what do you think would be the most important achievement of the working document, um, including the targets and indicators uh, that would be like the sustainable development goals, targets and indicators, emphasizing child rights principles, outlining practical examples of good practice and gaps, or outlining existing guidance and standards, or don't be afraid to say that you don't know. Uh, we'll give you uh, just a few more seconds to do that. We're nearly at 50% voting now. And then we do have a number of questions that have already come in. Please don't forget to use the questions box or the chat box to send us questions. We've already got uh, about five, uh, but as we will continue taking them and do at least two, but potentially three rounds. 62% of you have voted, so let's try and close this up in five, four, three, two, one. Are we going to hit 70%? One more person, maybe? Maybe not. 
Um, I'm going to close the poll. Yes, we've got 70% voting and we can see quite a diversity here. Slightly over half um, saying that emphasizing child rights principles. So this is a very different answer than we heard in our earlier poll, perhaps. Um, swayed by Jacqueline's important reminder that child rights principles are still quite important when speaking to policymakers. 47% um, nearly half of you uh, highlighting the importance of practical examples and gaps, good practice and gaps, and then just over a third of you highlighting the SDG-like targets and indicators and outlining existing guidance and standards. So uh, I think strong support for all four of those um, areas of work. To turn to our first round of questions, uh, first of all, a note to um, the initiative organizers that have, there have been many requests for the PowerPoint uh, and also questions about when the draft document would be available. So that is something that we can turn to. Um, Five questions for both Jacqueline and, and Mike. Mark Engman has noted that although the New York Declaration has good language on children, the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework did not include similar strong references to these themes. Uh, Mark says this is disturbing as the framework is intended to inform the preparation of the Global Compact. How can we ensure that the spirit of that declaration concerning children uh, goes into the compact? And I think that is a general question that we um, have are spending most of this uh, webinar discussing, uh, but uh, thinking about the discrepancy between those two documents may be important. Pinar Aksu has asked what your definition of child immigration detention includes. Malta Founders. Um, and please forgive my pronunciations, uh, is, has asked specifically about the inclusion of children with disabilities. Vanda Altarelli has indicated that uh, he or she, I'm suspecting a she, uh, may think that the targets are not realistic. To what extent do you think your targets are realistic? Um, and finally, a relatively complicated question from Matumon Katarinchuk, who says that uh, they like the idea of including the process of return to the country of origin in, in the monitoring procedures. Um, integrating refugees and migrants into domestic systems is sometimes criticized by the government uh, concerning budgets uh, in the sense that refugees and migrants are being supported, but that is stressing the existing system. The government claims it is burdening the system. How can we make this consideration of um, services more positive for refugees and migrants? How can we focus on this without creating resentment or perhaps jealousy, I would add? Um, that is our first round of questions, and then we will collate those that are coming in now for our next round. Over to you for five or ten minutes, Jacqueline and Mike. Um, well, I, I'll, Mike, if it's okay, I'll speak briefly to the first, the third, and the fifth, but love you to say more about the first two, about the refugee document, and then I'll leave it to you to talk about attention and the realism of the targets, if that's okay, but anything else you want. So let me just start off by saying um, uh, it's point well made about the refugee document, and I think in general it's interesting to see the difference between the two. The, the treatment of the two, um, you know, compact, the background for the two compacts, because the refugee one is clearly very much a continuation of the current framework and of UNHCR's um, current uh, work and, and policies and priorities, whereas the migration one, in a way, is a new departure. It's got um, new ideas. It was. It, not really based on a, a previous situation. IOM has only just come into the UN family. So I think you're absolutely right to point to this difference. It's interesting, and I think you're right. It does create a challenge. Um, I think one of the interesting developments that's happened in the refugee context is how um, differences between jurisdictions have um, widened. So in some situations, you have quite progressive jurisprudence on on 
you know, asylum adjudication regarding minors, and in others you really don't. I mean, and then of course in the European context you have the positive impact of of, of, of the kind of EU framework. So I think our challenge is really to try to migrate good practice across jurisdictions, but also to um, work with our colleagues in UNHCR who are focused on children's issues, and there are some very good colleagues within the organization who are, who are, who are doing that, to, to provide them with the materials that they need, whether it's examples or analysis or, or data. Um, but I think we would also welcome ideas, you know, that any of you may have. On the disabilities question, um, very important consideration. We know that up to 8 to 10 percent of the population as a whole um, has disabilities. Uh, a smaller proportion of the migrant and refugee population for obvious reasons, but still a, a significant one and still you know, neglected and extremely vulnerable. So I think um, this is a, a very important consideration, both in terms of um, shelter and protection. We know that disabled populations, including disabled children and disabled girls, are much more prone to violence than their non-disabled peers. So this is a, a real concern. Um, and we are seeing, I, I think those of us who have been, you know, working in the context of the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, very high uh, proportion of, 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 of mental disabilities, of trauma, these sorts of reactions to, to the experiences. So there, there's a real dearth of, of care here and something that we need to enhance. And I think, you know, the motto, nothing about us without us, of course, is critical. We need to have disabled um, refugees and disabled migrants informing our policies more than we've done so far. But again, examples and suggestions most welcome. Um, the last point I think is a really important point. Um, and I think there is a lot of scope. So just to reiterate the question about um, how do you reduce resentment against um, policy makers and uh, administrators who include uh, adequate or generous budgetary provision for non-citizens? How do you, how do you uh, include, uh, how do you improve the reception of that in domestic uh, populations, particularly those who might be hard-pressed economically or otherwise? And I think this is something which is, is of course, of critical importance. I think there's both before and after considerations here. One needs to anticipate this much more than we have, as you know, elections on both sides of the Atlantic have shown. The, the impact of uh, unexpected and large in, um, inflows falls very differently on different communities, and we need to address more carefully the impact than we have. But I think we also need to, and I've just seen something recently suggesting that we need to celebrate the resilience and the generosity of host communities maybe more than we do. I think there's a sense that policymakers are more progressive and communities are more hostile, but actually the evidence is not consistently that. So we need to do a better job of, of, of um, conveying the uh, different sets of attitudes within communities. But I think the, probably the most important thing is to have good data showing how after an initial period, which is certainly under a decade and sometimes under five years, migrant communities actually give much more than they get in terms of economic um, inputs and outputs not necessarily across the population as, uh, in, in particular areas, but as a whole. So that data, I think, is not widely known. So migrants and refugees generally are not so-called burden economically um, for more than, you know, the initial period of accommodation. And that evidence needs to be much more widely and comprehensively communicated. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Jackie. Well, uh the first question is, what does child immigration detention refer to? And the answer is to any cases of ch children under 18 being locked up uh, because of their immigration status, whether they're unaccompanied or separated children or uh, have arrived with their families. 
and whether it's near uh, or at the time of their arrival or being identified, or when they're held while a decision is made about what should happen to them, or when they're jailed uh, while preparations are made uh, to um, put a decision into practice, such as deportation or, or return. Uh, so it, it, um, it covers everything. Uh, at the moment, uh, we've seen some states uh, appear to agree that it's not a good idea and that it isn't in the child's best interest to put them uh, into detention. And yet they'll still justify detaining children when they first arrive for health screening purposes or for um, age determination purposes. Um, so uh, we've recognized so far that if we try and separate out in great detail the few circumstances in which it would be uh, acceptable or, or, or less unacceptable to detain children, that um, we create a loophole through which um, the, the more repressive governments will pour en masse. And so uh, we're not suggesting that we, as a community, point to the few circumstances in which detention might be justified. What we're really wanting to do beyond, uh, or is at the same time as ending immigration detention, is to ensure that uh, alternatives for keeping track of people, adults and children, families, are developed. And particularly uh, to ensure that if, um, an adult who applies for refugee status is refused that status and is going to be deported to ensure that there are um, alternatives to imprisoning or detaining the, the, the adult with children or with other family members. Uh, and, uh, and essentially, we think that states, governments have been uh, lazy, have been negligent in developing those alternatives. So we will be in the targets putting an emphasis on developing uh, the alternatives. Let me next address the fourth question about whether the targets are realistic. Um, and, and I'll assume that you weren't using the word target perhaps in a terribly specific way. So we've got goals and targets. Um, and in a way, we want these to be realistic, but a bit more ambitious and a bit more optimistic than mere realism would uh, 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 accept. So as we listen to anti-immigration politicians around the developed world, um, we're not trying to tailor our goals or targets to them. Uh, we are trying to uh, ensure that they're, at least with the goals, uh, feasible to include in the global compacts or for the governments that are debating the global compacts to recommend to others. And we'll try in the time that's left to modify our targets so that they do become, as Ignacio said at the beginning of this presentation, a timeline uh, that stretches as far as, as uh, 2030 and potentially even um, beyond. We'll set targets that should all be hit before 2030, but we recognize that the more ambitious ones that might not be hit, uh, uh, we might not set uh, to be achieved until 2028 or 2030. They are in a way uh, on a timeline that stretches into the future. But um, yes, we want those goals to be achievable. So if they are not, or if the ones you've seen today are not uh, achievable in your part of the world, I think it's helpful if you, you, you tell us. Uh, and on that very last point um, uh, about sorting out the, the finance, you know, in a way, the, uh, the trip that sent us into this discussion about global compact is precisely the fact that so many refugees left Syria and some other places, but particularly Syria, that it's completely unfeasible for the neighboring states to pay for the, the, the costs. 
So there is a discussion about cost that is uh, related to refugees uh, that's ongoing. There isn't a similar discussion about migrants. There have been a few specific issues up until now, such as how uh, people who've been trafficked from one country to another, which, which state will pay for their repatriation, and there have not been much uh, uh, um, movement ahead in terms of setting the, the standards. So uh, we hope that the Global Compact will be um, an opportunity for those issues to be discussed. We're not looking specifically to have an input on, on those issues at, at the moment. Um, we're also wary of uh, repeating the message that is implicit in the New York Declaration, which is that uh, the best option, the automatic reflex option, should be to return migrants to their country of origin. Um, we're very much uh, emphasizing the reflex option uh, that's in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is that any decision must make a child's best interests a primary consideration uh, and that uh, uh, no automatic uh, decisions uh, should or can be made without a specific analysis of the individual child's circumstances. Thanks very much. Back to you, uh, Mark, I think. Thank you, Mike. And we have just eight or nine minutes left, so I'm going to bring this last set of questions to you and Jacqueline, and then Daniela and Ignacio can chime in. If you could limit your responses to this round to about two or three minutes each, that would be great. It may be difficult, given that we have a, a wide variety of questions here. Alina Potts is asking if you could speak more about uh, differences between younger and older children. Uh, in practice and policy, she says, it seems easier to communicate principles and procedures for children in the earlier stages of development, but there are particular difficulties in ensuring respect when it comes to older youth, uh, such as 16 or 17 year olds who are often seen as adults or people who may be quote unquote lying about their age when they are arriving unaccompanied. Very interesting point and question. Uh, Monica Sandvik Nyland uh, has two questions. Uh, she's asking why you separated child protection from number eight, and I think she's referring to the, the numbers you laid out, which is about access to services. She is expressing concern that child protection will be considered a principle rather than a service. Uh, she also asks if there, if you have given any consideration to more systematic cross-border cooperation between child protection authorities. Two last questions, both of them very interesting. Eloisa Miura is asking what your main challenge is as the authors and organizers of this initiative have been in developing the report, given that the, compact, the compacts encompass uh, a wide and very diverse range of actors. Um, how have these challenges affected your work and how do you try to overcome them? And finally, uh, Chawarat Chawarang Cool says, in my context, the government uh, makes the excuse that they have the parents' consent to keep children in detention, and that because of that, it is in the best interests of the child. Uh, how would an issue like that be addressed in the, the global compacts? So with seven minutes left, I'll give Jacqueline and Mike three minutes each, and then one minute to Daniela and Ignacio, and then we will wrap up uh, right at 11.30. Over to Jacqueline and Mike. Thank you very much. I'll take the first two questions, if that's OK. Wonderful questions. So the difference between older and younger children, of course, is very significant. And you just have to think about the question of detention. When you're talking about um, you know, older children, one of the reasons for detention often is uh, so-called flight risk. And the reason for flight risk is that older children typically want to work, they want to make decisions about what they're doing, and so being um, being held in, in inappropriate settings um, is going to likely prompt them to leave, and that's the justification in some places for, for locking them up. So I think it's a very important point. Um, I think we do need to distinguish. It's not a clear-cut division, whether it's at 12 or 14, there's no clear cut-off. 
but I think that uh, we need to think about this much more. And in my view, it's partly just a question of resources. If you have more resources, then you have a more disaggregated approach and you think more carefully. The worst thing is to have a kind of a division between the sweet little child who just needs protection and the older child who is just a kind of uh, juvenile in the making. And that's, I think, in many ways what we have. So I appreciate the question. And I think it's an important, very important point for us. Um, Cross-border cooperation is, I think, one of the most critical things. Um, we have thought about that. We will be thinking about that more. Um, I think um, it's where one of the biggest challenges is, one of the biggest lacunae, and I'm hoping that the global compact process will really enable a much more vigorous uh, set of communications, networking, collaboration between uh, officials charged with uh, child migrant and migration uh, protection responsibilities. And if I can just say the other aspect of that question, I think, was child protection um, as a principle, not as a service. I mean, this is a discussion within our own group. Uh, you know, we have different views about the terminology of child protection, uh, as I think I mentioned at the outset. But um, again, if you have uh, a view you'd like to share with us, we'd be delighted to receive it. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Jackie, um, and thanks very much for the questions. Uh, well, first of all, on the challenges, there's certainly been a, a fair number of these. Uh, a lot of us who are involved are used to thinking about standards and norms, and so to move into a planning mm, frame of mind whereby we, we set a goal to be achieved by 2030 and then divide this up into the, the stepping stones, the targets, and then set indicators. Uh, that's challenging, particularly because it's been done uh, in the Agenda 2030, but been done rather imperfectly, so we don't have a, 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 a hugely good uh, model. But some of you, I hope, will have an opportunity to uh, see a, a sort of alternative model that the UN Special Rapporteur on Migrants' Rights, Francois Crippo, is uh, publishing uh, more or less at the moment. So, uh, do have a look at that. It's not child specific, but it is very relevant for us. The second uh, challenge is to find all the suitable good practice examples that relate to the things we're saying. And an even bigger challenge is to then summarize that information for diplomats, non-specialists, people who don't know, uh, for example, uh, why um, the, the former Soviet Union repatriated uh, unaccompanied children in the way that it did. You know, it, how can we get it across without uh, all the history? So that's uh, uh, another challenge. Uh, let me close by just um, commenting on the issue about parents' consent. Isn't it marvelous that if parents say you can beat their children, uh, then it now becomes in their best interest? And similarly, uh, if parents say they can be detained, then all the wisdom of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and countless other UN human rights uh, specialists can be swept aside so that the parents, uh, under the influence of culture and of their own government, say, OK, detain them. Uh, the answer is, I'm sorry, that that's, uh, it's a factor, but it's not um, uh, a primary consideration that justifies children's imprisonment. Uh, it's a little bit the same. We've seen other issues. The, the importance of family is cited by some governments as a reason for, for deporting children and sending them back to the parents in a different country. Um, I think one has to be uh, very careful there and ensure that uh, rights arguments are put up uh, and perhaps you question rather carefully what the motivation of uh, government, at least, is for when it when it justifies uh, um, something that is quite evidently a, a violation of rights. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to all of you for your questions, and back to you, Mark. Thank you. So over to Daniela and Ignacio for final thoughts. Uh, while they give those, I'm launching our second to last poll. This is a simple one. Do you think that an approach with targets and indicators for the global compacts is realistic or unrealistic, or you don't know? Um, Daniela and uh, Ignacio, the final closing remarks? 
Sure, Mark, thank you very much. I wanted to really thank um, Jackie and Mike for this uh, presentation. It, they've done a, an incredible and tremendous work on this um, first draft of the report, so we would very much encourage you to send us also your thoughts and um, and, and feedback um, on what has been discussed today. Um, there are obviously there is quite a lot that we still need to um, to iron out, as um, uh, both Mike and uh, and Jackie mentioned. Um, for example, just to pick one. Uh, the issue around where child protection fits in this uh, um, in the system, and um, and it is both as part of uh, of um, uh, services and a part of principles. But we took it out to provide um, some uh, st strong visibility to the fact that child protection is um, a key element in this um, in this debate. Um, so that's why you see it as pulled out um, in the um, in these presentations. Um, and obviously, there are many challenges that children are facing themselves and uh, at different ages. And as Mike was saying, there we're still facing. Um, excuses and uh, and very <laughs> um, interesting arguments as to how um, to justify continuous violation of children's rights um, including uh, within the context of uh, of detention of children um, justifying it um, as uh, protective custodial arrangements uh, which obviously as you will uh, fully understand is not um, in the best interest of the child. So that's why the best, how to operationalize the best interests of the ch child, what that means in practice, what is that we would like states to very much put in place, what roadmaps that we see in front of us is absolutely crucial in this context and at this moment in time and it's absolutely crucial that it's somewhat reflected in the in the two compacts um, so I think I'll leave it at that with this um, reflection and um, and also um, leave to Ignacio um, to say a couple of words but thank you very much to all for participating in this, uh, in this webinar today. Yeah, three very rapid points. One, uh, really to thank you all the different uh, 12 or 13 questions that came in. This really helps us and very much appreciated. If not, um, two other rapid points. One on the challenges of where, where I sit, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, not to have another non-binding instrument. That would not be helpful. And the attempt that is made here, and I'm really happy to see the results, and I help you there, Mark, to see that almost 70% of the people that remained on the call think that it's realistic to uh, this approach with targets and indicators, and 20% who uh, feel that they don't know yet. So very few after this conversation feel it's not uh, realistic. And actually, that's what we're getting also as feedback from several governments who are giving us more and more support on this uh, this ap approach, whether it be Switzerland or uh, Germany, and there are other governments that formally are uh, expressing their, uh, their support on this. this. The third point I wanted, and it's a question which I'm not sure we answered, is the question of the availability of the document. You see there on this slide the, the website www.childrenonthemove.org. In there, you will find information on the initiative, specifically on the conference 12th and 13th of June in uh, Berlin. But also, there is a section called Resources. End of May, you will find the draft uh, 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 document uh, that will be, uh, be presented at the global conference. And uh, you are invited to, as has been said on several um, uh, occasions during the uh, during the, the course of this uh, webinar to um, give different in inputs and mainly examples. And there there was Amy Hong's uh, email that was put on uh, a slide. So it's amy.hong at terrorism.org. So over to you, Mark, and thank, thank you all for this uh, webinar.
we have run over by four or five minutes, but I think we would all agree that it was because this was full of a lot of thinking and information. Please do honestly and openly um, rank the webinar. It should be up on your screen right now. Uh, a final thank you. Please do, um, you will receive an email, I believe in 24 hours, uh, that will provide a link to uh, all of the documents and to a recording of the webinar um, that you can share with others. Um, again, big thanks to Daniela Reale of Save the Children, Ignacio Packer of Ter des Um, uh, and Jacqueline Baba of Harvard University and Mike Dottridge for their very important work. It's Wonderful to see this moving forward. I totally agree with, with Jacqueline that this is the golden moment and it is a pleasure for us to play some tiny role in it by helping to spread the word and gather input about the important work that you're doing on the uh, Global Compact. So um, please feel free to reach out and with no further ado, we will close the webinar. I'm glad to say that two-thirds of you were satisfied and one-third were very satisfied. So that's a pretty good result, I hope, for a webinar. I will hide this so that you can once again see Amy Hong's email address. And with that, we will wrap up. Please look forward to the email tomorrow with all of the documents and the recording. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>